What's going on, everybody? Welcome into an impromptu stream because Neil Olshay has been fired. Finally, after a month long investigation, the Trailblazers decided to file ne fire Neil Olshay. We'll talk replacements. I'll give my thoughts on Olshay's tenure. We'll answer your questions. Eric has been streaming for a bit. Shout out to you if you were in his solo stream over on his channel. Uh. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna discuss this. First off, nine a.m. news drops are not my friend. Uh, that was I don't know why they gotta break it at nine a.m. Man, you can't break it at like one. Uh, that'd be. How late did you stay up playing Minecraft? <laughs> I, was, I stayed up till about three thirty. Three thirty, but that's like my normal hours. I mm -hmm. stay up till about three thirty. Wake up at like eleven to twelve. It's kind of my normal hours anyway. Um, and yeah, I. Uh, yeah, yeah. 9 a.m. Honestly, even my if my hours were as good as I wanted, I probably wouldn't be waking up right at 9 a.m. Um, because there's there's no reason for me to with the work I do. Uh, there's no reason to wake up at 9 a.m. So uh, 9 a.m. news drops are not my friend, but we still got your reaction. This is still I still haven't really processed this. If I'm being quite honest with y'all. Uh, Eric obviously has time to talk about. I, I assume you talked about potential replacements already and all that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so I, I'll give my thoughts on some of those. You can kind of guide the conversation, I guess, if you want, Eric. Because we got no plan for the stream. We're just going to discuss this. Um, it's funny because apparently a couple people were saying not, uh, we were in shambles on Twitter, Eric, or that we were upset. I'm not yeah. upset. I am. I am happy. I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. Here's the thing. Like, for some reason, there are certain people that constantly talk about us, um, are we're constantly being brought up, and uh, those people think we like care about their opinions or seek their opinions out or whatever. Like, I haven't looked at. Most of their tweets um, in a long time. We have a a group chat on Twitter where um, a few months ago we actually specifically told people to stop sharing those idiotic tweets from those people in our group chat, so we didn't have to see them anymore. And we have started ignoring them now. People still do from time to time, and it's funny. But um, yeah, I don't give a crap about any of those people, and they're stupid. And yeah. Uh, that's, yeah, yeah, that's the first point I want to make is I just, can we be done with well, all the the BS, <laughs> right? Yeah. Your old Shay's gone, Stotts is gone, mm -hmm. all right? Now, get a good GM, and j can we just relax? Can we chill, all right? Because the, the Twitter nonsense, the fan base beefing back and forth for us has just been been rough. And I'm sitting here, I'm not upset. I'm actually kind of happy. Now, I'm not as happy as when Stotts got fired. I'm sure you guys can probably tell that. I'm <laughs> over the moon ecstatic right now. Yeah. But, like, there needed to be a resolution. I ranted about that last night on the post-game show. There needed to be a resolution to the situation. The team coming out playing with no energy. Uh, I mean, we went on a whole rant about how they played last night. They did not play well. They did not play with enough effort or enough energy. And you need a GM in place that Chauncey can go to and talk to about certain players and maybe get certain players moved. Now, I saw one of the names, and we'll discuss the, these in a little bit, but one of the names that was tossed out there is Tayshawn Prince, who, of course, won a championship with Chauncey Billups. A guy like that would be great just for his, he'd have a good working relationship with Chauncey Billups. And I guarantee you Chauncey Billups kind of knows what some of the issues are right now better than, you know, me and you do. Uh, so overall, uh, it's a situation where, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy with this resolution. I'm happy this is finally over. I'm honestly happy to get a new fresh set of eyes, right? And... Uh, I don't think Olshay was completely against trading CJ McCollum like some people act like he was. I think he would have done it in the right deal, but he didn't feel like the right deal materialized. But mm -hmm. maybe a new GM might be more aggressive with shopping CJ McCollum. Maybe a new GM will be able to sell other GMs on CJ McCollum a little bit better. Uh, I don't know. It's just it's going to be nice to have a fresh voice, fresh set of eyes uh, as the, the president of basketball operations and the GM of this team. Now, right now it's uh, 
what was what was the dude's name? Jim Cronin? Joe Cronin, I think. Joe Cronin. Okay, yeah. yeah. Right now it's Joe Cronin in interim, and they might keep the interim all season long. I don't know. But uh, there's been some yeah. interesting names tossed out, and it'll just be good to have a fresh, fresh voice, fresh set of eyes on this roster to maybe see – uh, if they can find an area of upgrade that maybe Olshay wouldn't have. But, I mean, the whole evaluation of Olshay and what he would or would not do is mostly just speculation. Um, so it's it's not going to be a situation where I'm able to, you know, if, a, if, we, if we bring in Tayshaun Prince and he makes a splash, I don't know if that's a situation where oh thank god we brought, brought in Tayshaun Prince because Neil Olshay wouldn't have made that trade uh I think Olshay was going to be aggressive this deadline so uh you know I I don't think it's necessarily a situation like that but it will be nice to have a fresh set of eyes and a fresh fresh voice Olshay never trades his draft picks well he yeah. just traded Gary Trent <laughs> and he let Zach walk in the offseason so he's not completely tied to him Doubles don't count. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, um, but I'm just, I'm happy to, honestly, Eric, Yeah. I'm happy to stop having to defend Yeah, that. now we don't have to. Eh, Although, like, okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is, <laughs> I don't even want to go here. Um, but, <laughs> um, see, I, I said this um, on the other stream. They, it's funny because we've talked about this several times in the last few weeks about how there's no nuance to these conversations. It's either you have to hate him or you're a lover of him. Right. <laughs> and mm-hmm. it's just, it's really annoying that um, when you're of the opinion, like myself, and I would include you in this as well, where you're fine with some of the moves he makes, like you think they're a good move um, considering you know, what he had to work with in free agency, I think he did a decent job, you know, signing people to minimum contracts, whatever. Um, but if you don't hate every single thing he does, then you're, like, you're in shambles today because um, you're you're mad he's fired. But, like, um, there's, there's different levels to it. We can want him to be fired because he's a bad person and created a toxic workplace environment and wasn't doing um enough as a gm but we can also say like the norman powell trade was a good trade the um the rodney hood trade was a good trade it wasn't his fault that he got injured the next year or whatever zach collins was healthy for two years and then gets injured um and who knows what he would have done given that starting spot and third year breakout you know like we're seeing with Nas and and uh you know ant or whatever um, but like there's different levels to it. So yes, we, we want someone new. We want a new direction. We don't want someone who creates a toxic, toxic workplace environment involved with the team. So we're happy he's been relieved of his duties and, um, yeah, it's, he was not a trash GM. He was, um, I'd say when you consider everything, probably, settle somewhere mid average right um yeah wasn't terrible wasn't good enough i guess um but like he did a lot of good things he did a lot of bad things i think it's been mostly good since paul allen died and he's been given basically free reign to do whatever he wants now that free reign turned out to be bad thing since he was not a good person yeah. and you can't create a toxic workplace environment when your whole spiel is about good character and creating a good culture um, with the players on the team and stuff. So uh, that's kind of ironic that he ends because his character wasn't good, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah, at the end of the day, like there's, it's not a case where every single person is either the best at something or the worst at something. And Olshay uh probably did not deserve to move forward um even if you exclude the toxic workplace environment it was time to maybe bring in a fresh set of eyes just yeah. like with the coach yeah i mean like then that's what he got fired for the uh he broke code of conduct mm-hmm. all right so 
uh, it's it wasn't even based on his job performance. Yeah. And I I agree with the firing forward how he ran his workplace and how he treated people like yeah. I'm down with down with firing him for that. And he hasn't been good enough to justify, you know, anything. Like he he hasn't been sitting here I don't know. He hasn't I think this roster is still better than people think. Mhm. I think this roster if anything has some flaws not in terms of like physical ability it has some flaws in terms of maybe a couple players aren't committed enough to doing what it takes to win so i don't really put that on olshay but it's also not so talented that you know okay maybe he can get away with being a, a bad person a bad you know, right yeah exactly bad. Yep. Like, he, he does not have that leeway with his job performance. So, uh, you know, and even if he did, if even if he was a fantastic GM and made fantastic moves and had the team in contention, it's still something that, you know, if he's not treating people well enough, like, yeah, you definitely look at firing him. Now, I don't know It why probably he... doesn't come out, though. It probably doesn't get to that point if he's doing a good job because, I don't know. Yeah. From all yeah. I've heard, it wasn't like a certain incident or whatever. And yeah. Yeah, it sounded like years of stuff. Now I don't know why the investigation necessarily took so long. It did, uh, but I mean, I don't know. It, it's I'm just happy to be done with this, man. I'm tired of defending O'Shea against stuff that like isn't true. Um, that's how I got labeled as an Olshea fan, I guess, is because I defended Olshea against stuff that was completely false, or like I defended Olshea against the notion that he could have done moves that he couldn't have. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the thing is, whoever we bring in is going with the fan base, with the people that hated Olshea, is going to have a lot more leeway, I think. So there's that opposite did. of spots <laughs> and yeah. Phillips. <laughs> yeah. You know, they're, they're going to have leeway. But I'm just wondering, say we bring in somebody new, or it could be the interim, and we don't trade CJ this season, I wonder what's going to happen. <laughs> I wonder what the reaction is going to be. Is it, oh, we brought in another GM who won't trade CJ. Oh, my goodness, we can't find a good GM. Like, I feel like that might be how this goes. I... I don't know. Um, whatever GM they bring in needs to have a, a plan. And here, honestly, here's what I would do if I was ownership. I would interview some candidates and ask them what roster moves they would try and do. And then ask them how they would try and run their workplace. <laughs> that would basically just be the two main questions. What do you want to do with the roster? How do you... Like, what do you want to do about the workplace culture that was toxic under Neil Olshay? That is the two... That, I don't even know if you got to ask anything else. Right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I want a GM that comes do in... Do a proper like, okay, background check. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want a GM that comes in and is like, okay, here's my plan. I want to... I would want to look at trading this guy and this guy and get back this type of player. Here are some potential targets. Like, you want a GM that's ready to hit the ground running and kind of has a bit of a plan. Now, that GM will want to talk with Chauncey and work with Chauncey to formulate some sort of plan of attack for the roster uh, in order to make it better. Because although I think this roster is better than most people think, it's obviously still not perfect. And I've always been down for trying to improve the roster. I've screamed for a CJ for Siakam trade all last offseason. Uh, so, we need a GM that's willing to come in and have a plan and be aggressive and go out and try and get players that they think can kind of fix some of the issues. Now, the problem is, is a lot of these GMs probably haven't heavily been watching Portland and don't know any of the issues. So it's, you know, maybe like if they're applying for the job, they need to rewatch some Portland games, right? They need to do their research on the job they're applying for and try and figure out what a potential fix might be. And a lot of the names are former players so it'll be interesting to see if we go the former player route and then how they handle um, just a team that is coming out in 50% of their games with no energy, which is inexcusable. Yeah, so here's the problem. Does Jody want that? 
does, does Jody this, want what? This team to get better? The, it, or is she hiring someone to better the team? Or is she hiring someone who has a plan to get them out of the luxury tax and save I money? Um, I, think, I think she wants she wants both, in my opinion. Yeah. Because they're not I mean, in the luxury I, tax at the moment, right? They are, yeah. How much are they into the luxury tax? Three million. Are they? Yeah. I think they were like half a mil below. That was last year. Yeah, that was last year. You're right. Um, so, but it, honestly, but like, I, I don't. I, I think she wants to win because, like, I don't think she would be coming to games as much as she does if she didn't want this team to be competitive. Mm-hmm. Like, if she wasn't showing up in the stadium, then I'd be like, oh, I don't know if she cares about this team winning. She just cares about the finances, but. She comes to pretty much every game. Yeah. That I see. So I like she cares enough to come to games, so I think she wants this team to win. Now she's also going to want to duck the tax. But you can do both. It makes it a little harder. But I don't I don't think it's a situation where they're gonna dump Anthony to miss the tax. I don't think that's a situation at all. I don't think it's a situation where Jody will go completely bonkers to duck the tax, but I think Whoever she brings in, she's going to want them to try and upgrade the roster while also ducking the tax. In a lot of our trade talk, as we head to the trade deadline, we'll focus on both those things. Mm-hmm. Trying to accomplish Yeah, that. I mean, that's the ideal scenario, but... Um, I mean, we don't know, though. Like, what is her plan? Like, I mean, of course we don't th- know. They're going with a similar situation with Seattle, uh, the Seahawks. Um, like... So they're kind of in the same spot. Like something's not working there. Like uh, they could switch out the coach. They could switch out the GM. They might trade Russell Wilson, you know. Um, But like it's hard to know like what direction they're going. Like what if she just wants to rebuild or just cares nothing about the basketball side other than financial. I'm not saying this is true or not, but. I, I, mean, I just never heard her like talk about it, so it's it's tough. Like yeah, I just like she shows up to games, so and she roots on the team. Like I I don't I don't know. Like obviously it's just speculation. Obviously we don't know. I just I don't think it's a. I think if she wanted to go that route, she would have tried to go that route this past off season, and we wouldn't be three million dollars into the tax right now. Mm-hmm. And I well I. I kind of think it's a situation where, okay, we go to the Western Conference Finals her first year, right? Um, and she was fine paying the tax then. The next year, we're below 500 at the trade deadline, and we have to dump scowl just to save money, even though it made no sense, that trade. Um and we're still over the tax. We still had the highest salary in the league that year, um, but we didn't. We had like an open roster spot and like eight guys injured, and we never signed someone to that open roster spot, right? Just to save a few million dollars. But we're under five hundred, right? So it's kind of like if we we're a like a contending team, like we were maybe the year before. She probably would have added someone, like allowed them to add someone. And then the next year, you know, uh, we're kind of battling around 500 uh, most of the year. I mean, there were some times where we went, you know, eight games above 500 or so and and did okay. And then we went on that huge run after the trade deadline where we won like 10 to 12 or whatever it was um, to finish with a good record. But um, most of the season, you know, we were, you know, playing – team type territory so it's like a situation where we're close to the tax if we would have been one of the top seeds we might have made an all-in move last year but she wanted to stay under the tax because we didn't um we weren't contending at that point and now we go flip to another year and Olshay is telling her oh it's the it's the coach or whatever and so he lets him change the coach, and then all of a sudden we're under 500 again. So it might be a case where she may have wanted to win all this time, but she's to the point now where she's not going to allow this to be a, a 
team with the highest salary moving forward if he continued to struggle. But. I mean, I'm sure we try and duck the tax. I don't think it's a situation where we... Like, we... It's not even really feasible to dump, like, $20 million. So I think we try and duck the tax, and that's about it. We duck the tax, we get a big old payout. Like, in the thing is, I can't even complain about them trying to duck the tax, because, like, we avoid repeater tax next year when we have to resign Nurkic, Covington, Simons, if we keep them, right? And we don't want to be in the repeater tax because the financial penalties are far stricter. And then, if we duck the tax this year, there's a huge... The luxury tax team's pay out money to the non-luxury tax teams right that's that's the luxury tax it gets paid out to the non-luxury tax teams and there's going to be some major tax payments this year so you duck the tax and you get legitimate tax payments like you legitimately get money so it's logical for her to try and duck the tax i don't think she's going to go anything beyond that um i so if you guys are thinking up trades, if you guys are using the trade machine, if you can make the Blazers save $3 million, around $3 million in that trade, it's a good deal. It's a good deal. Now, that's the thing is, like, if you're doing CJ for Siakam, then Siakam makes $3 million more than CJ. You'd probably have to figure out a way where the Blazers shed some more salary, which would likely mean including Rocco to a third team, and that team hopefully giving up a first-round pick that you could send to Toronto. Um, right? Like, but here's the thing. Toronto doesn't want CJ either, so you'd have to find a team for CJ, so that would likely be a three- or four-team deal. Uh, overall, it's a situation in which uh, it's not going to be an easy situation for a GM to come into, but I don't think it's a situation where Jody wants to blow it up. I don't think it's a situation where she doesn't want the team to get better. She's going to want the, the team to duck the luxury tax and try and improve. I think that's kind of where she's at. Like, otherwise, I don't think she'd waste her time even coming to games, especially with this whole investigation going on um, that fans aren't happy about. Like, I don't know. I feel like if she was like, oh, I don't care about if this team is winning or not. I care more about the finances. She would probably just disappear. Right, so I, I don't know. I, I don't think she's any. I don't think she's anywhere near as invested as Paul Allen was. That's pretty obvious. But I don't think it's a situation where she doesn't want the team to be competitive. Yeah, um, I hope you're right. I mean, I, I, I this is. Your tune has changed on this. No, I... It's just... It's not my tune. Like, I, I do think she cares about the team. But also, the front office is a joke, man. It's, it's an absolute joke. And I don't know if her leadership is going to allow... Whether by design or just because of her lack of doing anything or whatever. Um, it's like, I don't know. I'm kind of, I'm just kind of worried that this whole like ship could just like go down right now. Like, um, like the ownership doesn't seem stable. The, uh, we've gone through now a president and general manager change in the last, uh, month. Um, it's just, it's like a situation where like, I'm, I mean, I'm hopeful, like maybe we're looking back on this day and be like, okay, this is the day we can look back on where the Blazers went from being a mediocre team that was underperforming to a championship level team because of, of this decision. Um, I'm just, I'm just a little worried that Jody Allen kind of like she cares about the team enough to keep it but she also doesn't care enough about it to want to really invest a ton into it as well so um, I'm not saying like I'm thinking that's the case I'm just a little worried that that's maybe the, the problem I, I I it just comes down to I, like financially if they dock the tax they're fine mm-hmm 
Like, even if she doesn't well, really care about winning, if they uh, duck the tax, they're fine. Well, from a salary cap perspective, yes. But from a business perspective, with the you know lack of attendance and all that kind of stuff, they might not be. Well, here's what increases attendance, firing all <laughs> shape. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, and then if you make a splash move, that But I think a lot attendance. of that has to do with COVID and stuff, too, still. but Yeah, I mean, yeah, but... You know, you see all the people on Twitter. Well, I'm not going to a game until all chase fired, all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's a situation where if you duck the tax in a move that makes a splash that might make the team better, fans are going to come back. Like, financially, it's a win-win. I don't think there's an incentive to, like, oh, yeah, we're just going to trade Anthony Simons for a cap dump, we're going to get worse and then struggle to make the playoffs. Fans aren't going to come back for that, and that's not going to financially help them as if they duck the tax and make the team a little bit more competitive. Mm -hmm. So, like, I think, you know, we're talking about the franchise being destabilized, but I think in the end, these moves are going, like, this move is going to stabilize, stabilize the franchise. I mean, that's the you get you bring in a new GM with a fresh vision that's hopefully able to duck the tax and make a good trade and accomplish both those things. Um, Eric Brandt, step on up. That's my nominee for GM. Um, but like, you bring in a new GM, better workplace. You have a new president. That doesn't. I don't know. I don't really view that as destabilizing. They've been preparing him for this role. They've been preparing Hankins for this role. Um, so overall, I'm not too worried. I'm not, I don't know. I, I don't think it's a situation where, I mean, by the way, anybody saying the Blazers to Seattle, like that's not happening. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more steps. There's a lot more steps to that. Like the Blazers aren't, the Blazers aren't going to Seattle. And, and the NBA learned their lesson from doing that. Yeah, time. like, yeah, I don't know. I... That's like nightmares, so I hate when people bring that up because that's obviously the nightmare situation. But, like, the league has to basically unanimous, almost unanimously vote off, vote on Portland moving to Seattle. They're not going to do that. Like, before that, there's even a chance for that to happen, they would just expand. And if Sacramento yeah, didn't move a few years ago, mm -hmm. they're not going to move a team with as good of a track record in the past as the Blazers. Yeah, yeah, so... Like, they're going to expand before they, like, that would even have a chance to even come close to even being possible. Like, that's, that's not, that's not possible. I think they expand in the next 10 years, to be honest with you. Um, more money. Two more markets, more money. They're going to expand. Um, and they're going to expand to probably Las Vegas and Seattle. That's well, my prediction on that. Part of the speculation with that is, um, Jody would not sell before that anyway if she knows that's possibly coming because you're looking at likely somewhere between one and three billion dollars as a franchise fee um for two teams combined and um that just gets paid out to the other 30 teams so yeah. uh, that's a significant amount of money that <laughs> she stands to make just by the league and expanding two teams and then she sells the team when it has the same value <laughs> as it had before possibly they always go up so probably probably more in a few years so yeah um yeah I, she could look at like 130 million just for expansion and then sell the blazers for two billion like you know and cash in and it's going to be the nba is going to be worth more when they expand so the team would be able to be sold for more yeah Yep. Yeah, and that the NBA is not going to want to move teams um, very often. Uh, there might be some situations like New Orleans right now that eventually they have to move a team just because it's not being supported. But they're not just going to allow an owner that buys, say, the. I mean, I'm pretty sure Balmer tried to move the team at one point, um, but like. They're not just going to allow teams to um, buy a team like, let's say, the Oklahoma City Thunder, and then move them. You know, they're going—they have to go through a process, and I just don't think that would pass unless 
unless the organization was just in complete financial ruin in the city that it was in just was not working out but we know that's not the case yeah and the thing is is normally that has to be the case for like a decade you know what i mean so I, yeah i'm not i'm not worried about that at all um Sending your questions about Olshe in this whole situation, or maybe we go. the roster going forward. Olshe is the worst GM in the NBA. Yeah. Well, he's not a GM in the NBA, so he's but, not a GM but, in the NBA. But that's what I'm talking about, dude. It's like Olshe was not good. He was not bad. He was somewhere in between. Yeah, he wasn't and the worst. He was by far not the worst. <laughs> um, like he has a solid team. I mean, yes, they haven't won a championship, but they're. <laughs> what GM has won a championship. Like, there isn't that mm-hmm. many. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean... I don't know why you didn't get a notification, Hyper Prime. Um, if, that's why, for Blazer... To get... To make sure you get notifications, right? Go to our Twitter page, at BlazersUpresYT, and turn on tweet notifications. For our Twitter page. The only thing we really tweet out on our Twitter page is anytime we drop something. An article on our website, a stream on the main channel, a stream on the second channel, um, that sort of thing. A video. So turn on tweet notifications for our Twitter page, at Blazers Uprise YT. That link is in the description of this video. Uh, yeah, uh, who will Blazer fans be mad at now, asks Bessim. Um, Jody, probably. Jody and Chauncey, and CJ. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, they still have people to be mad at, and they still, I don't know, there's still people out there that want to be mad at something, so they'll be mad at, at those two. Um, how do you feel, like, the? how do you feel the front office handled this? Uh, Alvaro, um, the way you phrase this is confusing. Alvaro says, do you feel like how the front office handled this is slash was disrespectful to Dame? Okay, that makes sense. Um, because it just feels like we lost another year of him due to poor planning. Olshe being like, this is no secret. I don't agree with that at all because, like, we can make a splash at the deadline. I, yeah. I don't, I don't see how we, if we made this move sooner, how it really changes much. Well, the bottom line with Dame, if he was questioning leaving and it was because of Neil Olshe. Neil Shea would have been fired this offseason along with uh, Coach Stott. So, obviously, this was a case where uh, Dame did not... I think it's I think it's completely made up that they Dame didn't like Olshea or whatever, and it's just because people don't like Olshea. But once again, I say that and I get ripped because I'm defending Olshea, right? Even though that's not what I'm saying. Um, but, like... <laughs> If Olshay had a or Dame had a problem with Olshay, he would have been gone by now. <laughs> so um, I just don't get it. And if Dame would have seen him treating people the way he was alleged to be treating them, I don't think Dame would be okay with that either. So um, yeah, it's a situation where. Um, I mean, I'm not even convinced Jody wanted to fire him. I think she had to, um, but like, I don't think she wanted to. Um, I think she was fine with it if she could fire him with cause, so she mm-hmm. didn't have to pay out his contract. Yeah, right. I don't know what he's making, but yeah. so go ahead. There's also this dynamic of. I mean, I mentioned this yesterday on the Kevin O'Connor video. It's like, what if we have had a possible trade on the table for a Pascal Siakam or something, and Dame said he wouldn't be happy if we made that trade or whatever? I mean, I don't know why he would, but it's possible that he has declined several CJ trades in the past and has said that he doesn't want, he wouldn't be happy if we made that trade or whatever. We know that Olshay has gone to him in the past with lists of names and discussed that kind of stuff. So um, <laughs> it's also possible that Olshay was kind of hamstrung by um, Dame not wanting CJ to be moved either. And it might be a case where we just have to make a move and let 
hopefully a better team <laughs> speak for the trade and have that justified with Dame when we're better off for it in the long run. But it's possible that Dame and maybe even Chauncey, like Chauncey has in the past has said some bad things about Ben Simmons. Uh, Dame has talked this summer about wanting people who want to win and have that passion for winning and don't like losing and stuff like that. So it's possible that those guys don't want Ben Simmons either. So it, <laughs> what do you do then if you're a new GM and your coach and your your star don't want you to trade for Ben Simmons, but like everyone else wants you <laughs> to make that move, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of dynamics here. Yeah. Uh, I, it's hard to say. It's hard to say how this plays out going forward, man. I just, I don't know. Like, I'm still trying to wrap my head around Well, the fact that Olshay's actually gone. It's hard to even yeah. think about, like, all right, what's going to happen next. The, the other interesting dynamic is, so Joe Cronin gets promoted. Mm-hmm. Um, like, is he allowed to now, is it business as usual? Is he, like, the acting GM, like, go search out trades? Or... Are they going to hire a new GM in the off season? Because if they are, he probably has to be allowed to make moves. But if they're starting their search now and are possibly going to hire someone mid season, that I don't know if you allow him to make a trade and then bring in a new GM and is like, what the heck? You just traded away this yeah. piece that I would. So they he might be kind of hamstrung to not be able to make those moves right now um, depending on how long they're doing but at the same time when we had an interim GM for a full season it was Chad Buchanan the year before Olshay came here and he was allowed to make trades traded Gerald Wallace away for the pick that eventually became Damian Lillard so um, maybe he has a home run move like that in him Um, he is known as a salary cap expert he was the the guy who uh, managed the salary cap. Now, that could be a good or bad thing, considering our cap situation in the past few years. But... Um, the, word, the phrase salary cap expert just doesn't... <laughs> it doesn't sound that cool to yeah. me and you, I feel like, because we know the CBA. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not that yeah impressive. But he was... I guess he was involved with a lot of the draft picks and things like that as well. So, who knows? Um Let's get to this donation, and then I want to ask you about the four names, and then there's a fifth name yeah. um, that have been made uh, about today. But Hyper Prime with the five dollar donation says, "Can Magic Johnson be a GM still? I think he did well for the Lakers, and I think he could be good for us. I'd be wrong, but curious what y'all think." Uh, that's Magic just Johnson funny. was awful. <laughs> like, I think I, I hope that's a joke. <laughs> that's funny to me because he doesn't want to be a GM. Yeah. Like that. That's 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 why that's funny. He doesn't even want, he doesn't want to be a GM. Um, he doesn't want to be a GM. Uh, yeah. Gabe asks, is that, I take it everyone is happy with Olshay leaving for the most part. Nobody's really nobody's upset with it. All right. Uh, so there's five names. Um, one of them is Danny Ainge. Two of them being reported by Chris Haynes or uh, Mike Aversley, and uh, it's like a front office guy with the Bulls. Uh, And then uh, he's pretty well respected around the league. And then Scott Perry is the other one who is uh, in the Knicks front office, uh, was involved with the Kings for uh, offseason. Oh, oh, no, no, no. no, no. They made (laughs) like a... Yeah. Um, (laughs) And then uh, I forgot who said this, but someone else mentioned that Tayshawn Prince and Brent Berry were both being guys that we would take a look at as well. Um, so let's start with Ainge. Uh, I know we've given our thoughts on Ainge before, but what what would your thoughts be on going that route? I, what has he done in the last five years that's impressive? Mm-hmm. He traded for Kyrie, so I guess there's your splash, but also it wasn't well thought through, and they lost him, and it was, I mean, we've seen Kyrie and kind of the way he's acted, and I don't know, I, like, I guess that's the splash move that people want, right, but 
I, I, I am not impressed by that. Um, that's really the only thing he's done. He ha he was in a great position five years ago, right? A bunch of super high draft picks that weren't even Boston's. They were Brooklyn's. They had Brooklyn's unprotected first round picks for multiple years. They drafted Jalen Brown. They drafted Jason Tatum. Two good draft picks. But uh, outside of that, I don't think he's made a single, a single, like, good, impactful move. Mm -hmm. And you look at where Boston is at right now, they're in the same boat as us. Um, now, you know, he, he has shown that he's able to make the splash move. But, I mean, shoot, Neil Olshay traded for Chris Paul back with the Clippers before he became RGM. He made a splash move for Chris Paul. So I don't think there's a situation where you just go out and get somebody just because they've made a splash move before. It has to be more detailed than that. Mm -hmm. So with Danny Ainge, I, I I don't know. I don't know, man. He could be solid. He could be really rough. Because uh, he kind of sat on his hands a couple of years where I don't think he should have. So I could see him coming in here and doing the same. It's hard to evaluate Danny Ainge without knowing what he would want to do, you mm. know. Um, now, well, if bringing in Danny Ainge meant that, oh, well, Danny Ainge and Brad Stevens are still cool. Brad Stevens <laughs> wanted to work in the front office. Danny Ainge was like, okay, here you go. Here's the role. All right. And then Danny Ainge becomes our GM and goes to Brad Stevens like, you know what? Jalen Brown would be uh, look good in a blazer uniform. And you guys look like you need a, a guard that can create some shots for himself. So... <laughs> CJ McCollum and a first round pick and Robert Covington for Jalen Brown deal. Like, I, th I don't think that necessarily matches, but something like that. If Danny Ainge could pull that off because he has a relationship with the Brad Stevens, then I'm hiring him right now. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a wink wink deal. I always knew I was going to be the Blazers team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always knew I was going to, cause oh. he's from Oregon, right? Mm -hmm. He always knew he was going to come home. And yes. yeah, I mean, from Eugene. Cool. Yep. Um, um, see, this is why I think Ainge is a possibility because he'd basically be like you'd hire him and he'd be Olshay without hopefully the workplace misconduct. Although I haven't heard the greatest things about him necessarily either. As, um, I hope those aren't true, but, uh, um, He's. We know that Jody's not going to be involved in the basketball decisions. I doubt Hankins is either. So it's a case where you kind of, if you hire someone like one of these young shots, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, do they? Is it, would it be a little overwhelming to come in and have to deal with like all this stuff that we require of our basketball operations person? Um, whereas Danny Ainge has done all that before he's, you know, probably one of the more qualified people to come in and handle this situation, um, and is a strong enough basketball mind to not really care about opinions and things like that. He will just do whatever he thinks is best or whatever. So, um, that those are the, pro the positives, um, the, the negatives are, I agree with you, outside of, um, I mean, there's no way about it. The Brooklyn trade was one of the best, if not the best trade in the history of sports, uh, getting all those picks for a, an aging Pierce and Garnett. Um, and then he, he made the trades to get those guys um, as well. Uh and I guess if you go back to that time, they were also in a similar situation where they had Paul Pierce and were making the playoffs a lot, but not really getting over the hump. And then he makes a big splash to get two stars to come play with him. Um, so I guess he could convince someone in an interview that he could do the same <laughs> here. But uh, I mean, those are kind of once in a lifetime type moves and to expect him to come in and pull that off here is pretty unlikely. Um, so I don't know if he'd be able to, but um, yeah, I mean, it's a situation where if it goes poorly for whoever we hire, they can just blame the situation. And if they fix it, they're, they're looked at as a hero because this 
situation looks like the worst situation ever right now you know? um, yeah. for a lot of people. Uh, I mean, that might be a casual take, but like um, it's not seen of as the most ideal spot to be in right now. Yeah, I mean, you got. that's why we got to get a GM with a plan of action. <laughs> like they, they have to know what they want to do in order to hire them, in my opinion. So that should be one of the interview questions. Um, Danny Ainge is would not be the top, top of my list. Probably. And this this is like the coaching search to me. And uh, once again, we'll talk about this more in a minute. But um, it's like the retreads, the people. Like I kind of want someone who's going to come in and just like try to make a name for himself and and uh, mm-hmm. not do something dumb, but like someone like Chauncey, like where they're really smart and see things just in a, a really different way than Ainge seems too similar to Olshay in my opinion um, both have yeah, a history of not making big trades they've made one big trade in their past um, they uh, I mean obviously Ainge has a as a title so you can't really compare them fully but like just in terms of how they would run everything and their their day-to-day operations and things like that he just seems a lot similar to him in that regard but, uh, I mean, I guess I wouldn't be, like, pissed off if we traded for – or if we signed Ainge, but I kind of want – it's the same thing with, like, Billups versus D'Antoni. It's like, well, why not just take a swing on someone who has the upside to being possibly the next, you know, Masai Ujiri or something mm-hmm. instead of someone who we just know is – has some flaws and is okay at times and could maybe do something good, but – I'd rather risk that with with someone who hasn't um, been proven. Yeah, agree. So I'm not super high on Ainge. Uh, next next target. Um, you well, let's, let's just talk about the young guys then. Uh, yeah. So Tayshawn Prince and Brent Berry are the two former players that were mentioned. Mm-hmm. And uh, Brent Berry, it's kind of weird because he's rumored to be interviewed for our coaching position. <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, he's done some work with TNT. I think, is he in the Spurs front office right now? Learning? I don't know. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's definitely someone who's been around the game and uh, trying to become an executive and stuff. But um, I'm interested to hear your take on this. But I think Tayshaun Prince might be the, my number one candidate right now. Not because I know anything about how he'll be as a GM, but he just comes from that same tree as Chauncey Billups. I feel like they'd be on the same page. They have a good enough relationship to where Chauncey could, like, if if, if just some random GM comes in and Chauncey's like, "Hey, uh, I don't like the way Roko's playing right now. Like, uh, I just can we." look into getting someone who plays more like this than this. Yeah. Like, I feel like Prince would already be on the same page with him, and, like, he wouldn't even have to necessarily say it. He would be like, dude, mm-hmm. I, this is what I'm thinking. Like, Roka doesn't seem to be doing it. It's like, yes, I was going to say the same thing type of thing. And that might be really cool to have a tandem that is that cohesive and just can openly communicate and – um, just kind of grow together in those positions and maybe we have a tandem that could lead us the next 20 years um, of Blazer basketball. Uh, and then, so, so yeah, I really kind of like that idea and um, not saying that you have to get someone who Chauncey wants to hire, but the better the relationship between those two people, I think the better the outcome could possibly be. Yeah, I Tayshawn Prince might be my number one choice at this point just Mm -hmm. because of that relationship. Having a good relationship between your GM and your coach is uh, something that you need. That would be, you know, talk about the franchise kind of being unstable. I feel like that would be a stabilizing move. Um, And Chauncey could go to Tayshawn and, uh, like you said, and... It would be like, like having a coach, page. another coach as the GM, you know, like an extension of him. And I, and yeah. My, yeah. And Tayshaun Prince, from all accounts, is a pretty personable guy. Um, solid, solid guy. So, 
I feel like his relationships with other GMs, he would be able to, to form solid relationships with other GMs. And that's the thing is like, there might have been some GMs that wouldn't didn't want to do business with Neil Olshay that you bring in Tayshaun Prince. He's respected as a former player who won a championship. Like, uh, it might open up some some trade negotiations that maybe weren't there before. So, uh, Tayshaun, Tayshaun's my number one choice simply because he would have a good relationship with Chauncey. They played on a championship team together. They know what it takes to win a championship together. Uh, and hopefully that connection and that relationship would extend itself to trying to build a roster and coach a roster uh, towards contention status. They also, um, so Tayshawn is currently working in the front office as the vice president of basketball affairs, whatever that means, um, for the Memphis Grizzlies. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been there for over four years now, almost uh, well, a little over four years. Yeah. Um, and he is uh, someone who is credited with um being really high on some of their young players and uh, one of the reasons why some of those players are there. So that's also a good uh, pro for him is that he um, seems to be doing or being a part of what they're building in Memphis and they have a really good young team with lots of talent. Yeah. Yeah. And as far as Brent Berry goes, like I, he doesn't have the same connection with Chauncey. But like mm -hmm. everything else would be like I don't know. Anything well, he else might because they Barry. they were both in um, like broadcasting for a little bit. True. Maybe, maybe just, have a relationship, but yes. yeah, it wouldn't be like Tayshawn and Chauncey though. I I don't know. I don't. I have no idea how Brad Barry would be. I have no clue. Mm -hmm. I I can't even speculate like because I have no idea. Do you have any thoughts on Brent Barry or? Um, that's. I mean, they're probably familiar with him because, like I said, they've already interviewed him recently. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I just, like you said, I, I kind of am leaning towards that connection with just go for the Billups Prince duo. And uh, um, I, I really like that idea. Uh, so all the other ideas kind of seem secondary to me, but I don't think I'd have a huge problem with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't either. I don't it's, know. It's just yeah, hard so. to know. Yeah, like, until he makes moves, it's, like, hard to know how they do. Yeah. Um, and then the other two candidates were some guy I've never heard of, so I don't know on Eversley or whatever his name is. Uh, and then Scott Perry with the Knicks is, I mean, the Knicks are a lot better, right? They, how long has he been with the Knicks? Uh, I want to say three years. And he, you said he was with the Kings before then. <laughs> yeah, well, he he joined the Kings that one off season where they had like everyone thought they had a really good off season, and then he left almost immediately. If if I'm that's just off the top of my head, but okay, I can't hold that against him then. Um. But so he comes to New York and he gets there and New York becomes a more competitive team than they've been in almost a decade or all but a decade. Um, and I don't know, though, like New York is not a contender, so it's not like he took a team in our position and took them to a contender. If he did, then I'd probably be asking for him. Uh, he took a team that was rebuilding, got them some competent players, got them a competent coach, and they became a playoff team last year, but then they just get bounced in the first round by the Hawks. And this year, the Knicks are, what, 500? So, kind of eh. He brought in, he signed Julius Randle, and the thing is, is like, the Julius Randle signing looks great now, but I think that's because of the work that Julius Randle put in and becoming a better player. Um, and maybe some of it being Tom Thibodeau. R.J. Barrett was an obvious third overall selection in that draft a couple years ago. Um, on top of that, I mean, they brought in Fournier and Kemba Walker this past offseason. Kemba Walker hasn't worked out. Fournier has been um, better for them than Kemba, but, you know, he's it's whatever, and it's not something that's going to really change that team. 
Uh, on top of that, they brought in some solid vets, but like role playing vets. You know, Derek Rose, Alec Burks, uh, Nerlens Noel, um, Tosh Gibson's there. I don't know. Like, it doesn't impress me as much as I feel like it might impress other people what he's done in New York. Yeah, and then. I don't know if he's like 100% responsible, but they also, I mean, they trade for Zingas for expiring contracts, mm -hmm. and then they um, basically fail to sign any of their targets. Um, it was so bad that Kyrie and K KD chose Brooklyn instead of New York uh, uh, when they were both had the opportunity to go to either one. Um, could have been the heroes of resurrecting the Madison Square Garden, right? Um, and then uh, um, they kind of just signed Julius Randle because they had to spend some of their cap. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and so they got kind of lucky there that he developed um, into a better player. But uh, yeah, I don't know if he's... Um, it's the same with Mark Eversley, um, who's the Bulls GM, who's not necessarily in full charge of the roster moves. Like, they're kind of, even though they're the GM or whatever, they don't make the basketball decisions. So, um, yeah, it's, it's like how much of it is his credit, how much of it is his vision, how much of it is the other guys in charge there. So, those are always hard to, hard to judge. And also, you don't know what they leave those positions for the Blazers right now if they're similar positions, even if they were given more power or whatever. Yeah. I, it's so hard to speculate GMs, man. I always wondered, like, how are we going to talk about game <laughs> candidates yeah. when this day comes? And I, I, I don't know. Like, the most I can speak on... Outside Danny Ainge, because he obviously has a track record, is just Tayshaun Prince's relationship with Chauncey. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is, Danny Ainge wasn't even, like, really tied to anything. It wasn't like Chris Haynes' report. I mean, I think I think Chauncey is my number one choice at this point. I, actually, he's my number two choice. Eric Brandt is my number one choice at this point. Um, and then Tory Jones is his number is my number one choice for his assistant GM. Uh, that would be killer. And CJ wouldn't get traded, unfortunately. <laughs> Just kidding. CJ would get traded for Jalen Brown, man. That's what we do. And then we also trade for Siakam. But I mean, overall, what do you think this team needs right now? Like roster wise, what do you think this team needs? Uh, I think we need, uh, well, we need some sort of, like, guy who's going to die on the court, basically. <laughs> um, yeah. Just someone who's, uh, like, I don't know, we need someone that's not only like a smart player and you know a good energy guy like a uh, uh Larry Nance is but someone who's like also like a little better than him <laughs> if that makes sense um yeah 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 i think we need some attitude we need some a guy like we need a competitor we haven't been competitive enough i don't know why well and this is it, it comes back to Rocco for me and See, even if he was playing like normal Rocco, he just is a guy who fits in on defense. And we need someone who, um, I, I agree with you, that's like tough, but someone who just like, because like Rocco doesn't have that, the like reputation that he's just going to like, be on you the entire game and like you're screwed when you have to go up against him you know like uh um like i'll bring up a davion mitchell you know he's got the off night nickname now and like uh like it's this happens a lot with cornerbacks in the nfl where they um it's almost like they become good just because of 
like how much confidence they have in themselves and um the, you know like i almost feel like we need a guy like that not not like a selfish guy but just someone who who's just like not only a good defender but just has like a bit of a nasty streak to him and just like will not refuse to ever give up on the court and just put it all out there yeah yeah and the only reason i say we need this is because we have too many guys on this roster that coast Mm -hmm. right like somebody just brought up the spurs were a dynasty with all nice guys but they were they were competitive on the court and like Ginobili was maybe a nice guy on the court he wasn't right but they they also had i mean they weren't trying to have like cover they didn't have a lot of weaknesses defensively so they weren't trying to cover bad guys you know they were they were like they could afford to be nice guys because they were all good defenders so um yeah uh yeah brian grant type player would be awesome when he came in and you know he's you know fighting carl malone in the playoffs and throwing elbows at him and you know just like getting in his face stuff like that like i don't i don't know have we ever seen roko do that um no i don't like her yeah no (laughs) so with our with our defensive deficiencies we kind of need someone who's going to come in and be that guy who not only is a good defender but makes up and is willing to take on that responsibility and i know uh yeah bro just said aren't you describing ben simmons no No, ben simmons is like more like roko that's the exact opposite of what i'm (laughs) I'm saying yeah i don't know yeah no no not not no um that's not ben simmons (laughs) definitely not shout jm one two three one five dollar dono he says what's up i've generally supported old shane i think he generally had a good sense with the draft but it was time to move on and turn the page uh agree uh move on see what we can do uh appreciate the dono jm it's play by play the whole like on the post game stream we went through like looking for a trade candidate that fits kind of that attitude that i think we need and i it's hard man i couldn't find one like People have tossed out Marcus Smart. Marcus Smart is not able to be traded this year. He signed an extension. He can't be traded until after the trade deadline. And obviously, you can't trade somebody after the trade deadline. Mm-hmm. So uh, he can't be, he can't be traded this year. Can't be traded. Um, I agree with Bando. Zach Collins would would be that guy probably, but fortunately, he just couldn't stay healthy. That's yeah. a shame too, because he did have you know. Calling Clay Thompson a hoe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need a guy who would call Clay Thompson a hoe, man. Um, agree. Yeah, I. But yeah, it's it's hard to find those guys, and the teams that have them don't give them up very easily. So, um, and Dame would love to have Draymond. Uh, yeah. that, that Dame would do anything to have Draymond on this team, but that's not happening, especially with how good the Warriors have been this year. I mean, it just comes back to Siakam for me. I There's a Raptors fan saying Siakam's trade value isn't that high right now. Uh, let me look at Siakam's stats. Siakam... They're, they're blaming him because they were doing well, and then he comes back from injury, and then... Yeah, he he kind of gets in Scotty Barnes's way. Like he, they have forwards that can do things. You know, you got OG. Now OG's hurt now, but you got OG and you got um, Scotty. That's kind of their forwards right now. Siakam is is my guy at the moment. Uh, my target at the moment. And the problem is, is uh, like you probably have to give a pick with CJ to get him, and Toronto probably doesn't want CJ, right? The- well, that's where the three team comes in, because I still think Philadelphia could use CJ. Yeah, oh. they just have to give up enough. But, like, if Siakam isn't working in Toronto, I doubt they want Ben Simmons as much as they did this offseason. I don't know. I've heard rumors that they're still interested. It makes no sense to me, but 
I mean, so. if they want Ben Simmons that bad, Philly, just wake up and take Roko and take CJ, right? Mm-hmm. And we'll take Siakam. The problem is we need a starting three, but maybe at that point you just say screw it and start Nasir Little, but at that point you don't have a ton of shooting next to Damon Norm. Well, if we traded Roko and CJ, we'd need another player too. I think uh, Toronto or uh, Philly would have to include someone else in that trade as well. Because I don't yeah. think it quite works financially. So, but what about what about this? What about this trade? What about? Let me make sure this works first. I wonder if you know what I'm going to say. Um, guess the trade I'm thinking of, Eric. Is it involved the three Ockham. teams? Doesn't oh. involve. I mean, well, if I say that, I basically just gave it away. Um, but yeah, it's for Siakam. Um, I don't know. Roko, Nance, Simons. Maybe Roko and Nance to different teams for picks. Toronto gets Simons and picks. Hmm. And then maybe we trade CJ for something else. Is that enough? Isn't that like... Yeah, it's 27.6 million. The thing is, is like, that's raising the tax bar, so you'd have to save legitimate money in a cj trade which would be really hard to do so that's why i don't think portland would do that yeah um yeah that would be i don't know we'd still have our three cards (laughs) that'd be funny i mean Yeah. yeah but at that point i think you like i would I'd rather have Siakam than Roko with what Roko's done this year. But oh, yeah. obviously our bench takes a major hit. The thing is, is you'd almost have to then trade CJ for a three. Like, yeah, I mean, at that point, just Danny Ainge, bring him in so he could trade CJ for Jalen Brown. <laughs> Which would be impossible. But that's the thing is we don't have enough assets to like swing something Swing a combo trade like that where we get two legitimate forwards. And the other thing to keep in mind, we're a game below 500. We have our pick lottery protected for Chicago, and that protection means we cannot trade a future first. So in order to trade future first, we'd have to uh, call Chicago and get them to agree on less protections or no protections on our uh, draft pick that we owe them this next year. Honestly, and what I would on, pitch... Go ahead. Sorry. On a below 500 team right now, yes, we might want to uh, you know, take that chance, especially if we're getting a Siakam or a Ben Simmons or whatever, but that could come back to really haunt us much like a trade Neil Shea did that ended up with the Cleveland Cavaliers getting Kyrie Irving in the number one pick. <laughs> Yeah, what I would try and do is, if we're trying to make a splash that would probably put us in the playoffs regardless, is call up Chicago and say, hey, we'll make it top four protected. But if it ends up in the top four, it turns into a second round pick. I don't know why they would do that, though. I mean, because if we're like 12th, 11th, 13th, like if we don't do well after we make that trade, you know, if we're hovering around the 8th seed. Mm Mm-hmm. If we struggle, maybe an injury hits, they get a better pick than they would otherwise be able to get through all their protections. And it wouldn't be like it, the chance that we would end up top four at that point if we're hovering around the playoffs and getting better is extremely minuscule. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. But yeah, Zach has a good point too. We're only a game and a half out of four, so it's not like we're yeah. like a tanking team or something. But... <sighs> I yeah I I want Siakam. I Toronto is not interested in CJ. Toronto might be interested in Simons, like for the future. Um, Although we did just trade him Trent, and they have Van Bleet still. And... Yeah, but I'm saying like if they're like going young, if they're going young, young Van v- Vliet doesn't fit that. Like how old is Fred Van Vliet's like what 29? Let me look him up. 27, almost 28. 
Yeah, he came into the league at age 22. Okay. I mean, Van Vliet's almost 28, so I'm not sure he fits, like, Trent's, what, 22? Scotty Barnes is 19, 20? OG's, like, 24? If I recall correctly, I'm trying to guess a bunch of ages here. OG is 24. So maybe they would want to go with Simons because Simons is, what, 22? Go young at the point guard spot. Somebody with upside. Tank the rest of the season. I don't know. They might not want him, but, I mean, I think Simons makes sense next to Trent, next to Barnes, next to OG for the future. It would be interesting. Mm-hmm. Trent would probably hate that. Yep. Yep. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. We don't have to talk trades if you don't want. I guess I just. I mean, that's the fun part about having a new GM is it opens up the yeah. possibility of trades that we know probably weren't possible this morning. Yeah, I mean, everything just comes back to Siakam. But, like, at that point, then I don't want Roko starting at the three. Like, if you do CJ for Siakam, I think it's likely that we do both CJ and Roko for Siakam. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, who's going to be our starting three? Yeah. That's what I'm struggling with. Um, because I don't know if I'd want Nas as our starting three. in that situation. I mean, I'm fine with not starting, but then our backup small forward full-time is like Snell. Or, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I just... Nasir's not shooting well enough for me, and defensively, he's making a lot of mistakes still. He's shooting... Like, you're going to have two 32% three-point shooters, and then Nurkic? <laughs> the shooting would be rough. Like, you need somebody that can knock down threes there uh, better than the Sirkian. and maybe you maybe Snell becomes a token starter but I don't really like that um obviously I haven't been the biggest fan of Snell but at that point we'd almost need a follow-up move and hopefully like it'd be a buyout guy because I, I I don't Snell is just eh so that's what I struggle with is like we probably have to give up CJ and Roko for Siakam and then who's going to be our starting three so, I mean, it honestly, oh, I don't know. Wait, eh? I was, well, was going to say Maurice Harkless, but he can't shoot anymore either. <laughs> why would CJ? Why would OKC want CJ? Why would I see? <laughs> yeah, why are they going to trade picks for? Yeah, that makes absolutely. We'd have sense to probably anymore. give them picks to take CJ. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no. Okay, see, rebuilding teams are not going to trade picks for CJ. Mm -hmm. Christian Wood cannot be our starting three. Um, I already have the trade machine open play by play just to look at players. I still think the the easiest move it's not a splash but trade Roko for Neesmith in a couple of seconds or something and they we get way under the tax we get a trade exception to maybe add a piece if we do a CJ type trade and then we get a, a young small forward that can maybe step in for in that backup spot if we did move it, make a move for Siakam or something with a, a CJ trade. Um, yeah. Um, honestly, and I said this last night, the only three I can really think of, and he would be extremely hard to pry away, but Will Barton. Mm -hmm. Rocco to a third team, maybe. I mean, Denver's not in the tax, though. I was hoping Denver was in the tax and would want to just shed salary if they're – like not competitive this year they've struggled with all their injuries so i don't think will barton is like gettable but will barton at the starting three is a better point of attack defender than Rocco. can play make shooting 38 percent from three 
might be more gettable because he hasn't necessarily been the healthiest guy. Um, Damani says, why not Nas? Which means he ain't listening to me, Eric. I just said, why not Nas? <laughs> He's not a good enough I, shooter, man. I agree um, with him. I don't know. He could be. You agree with me? Or, no, with, um, with chat. Do you, do you really think that it would be okay to have two 32% three-point shooters and Nurkic in the starting lineup? Uh, yeah, I think we'd be fine as long as we had a motion offense and we'd still have Norm and, C and Dame for shooting. I just don't think that's enough shooting. Like, if, I you're mean, gonna utilize, if you're going to utilize Siakam's and Nurkic's, like, passing ability, you almost need a, a third shooter out there. Yeah. I know. And, well, so someone said that Neesmith is highly valued by Boston. Um, he's playing nine minutes a game. Uh, and, yeah. So... I mean, Trevin, it, it, the percentage is what it is, man. Like, Nas is not a knockdown three-point shooter yet. Like we, I, I, I think, I think we would struggle shooting wise. Like, a little bit too much. I would rather have somebody. Well, and here's the thing: is Nas is not Nas is not like to the point defensively where it's like okay fine like you know the shooting is going to be rough but he's going to be so good defensively next to Siakam that we're going to be fine like if Nas was a lockdown on ball defender then sure you take that that risk with the shooting and you hope Nas improves um Damani says Nas would get quality looks he's already getting quality looks and he's shooting under 32 percent so but he's young enough to where he could still improve that I mean, yeah, you'd, just, you'd be banking on And Siakam shot well the season. Like, he wasn't the main guy. Yeah, I mean, but like you're... I don't know. I would rather have a safer option than just like, okay, I, hopefully Nasir Little will just start shooting the ball better. Well, honestly, though, you just you just start Snell. Um, obviously, he hasn't shot great this year, but if you can get somewhere back to 40%, and just be a floor, a corner floor spacer, and then you bring Nas in and stagger him a little bit. I I think that'd be fine. Yeah, Snell's just not good enough defensively for me. I mean, he in a team defensive scheme when we get Siakam, I think he'd be okay. Yeah, I just want somebody like I would like to have somebody that would defend the ball better. Mm -hmm. Um. That, that would be, like, because that's the thing is Will Barton, I think, is a good on-ball defender. And he shoots 38% from three. That's why I like him as a target. Um, just for the record, for anyone saying Jeremy Grant in chat, um, Jeremy Grant does not want to leave Detroit. I have a pretty good source on that. Um, he just does not want to leave. He He's happy there. He's fine with losing. As long as he is the man on the team, and uh, mm -hmm. he, that's why he left Denver, and um, that's well, one, that's not really the attitude we'd be looking for. <laughs> Someone who cares more about being the the main guy on a team than leaving a situation that is a winning situation. But um, not that he has a no trade clause, but he would not be happy if he was traded, um, from what I hear. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, like, taking a flyer on a Neesmith would maybe be the, you know, he's known as somebody who can shoot. He struggled to shoot this year. Um, but he's also known as a good defender. So you well, take a guy, about, uh, take a flyer on an undervalued guy. A guy who was on Boston who struggled to shoot and was kind of getting a bus label, but had some defensive potential. Evan Turner? No. <laughs> Our head coach. Oh, Chauncey. I I mean, but Chauncey is more of the outlier than the rule. No, um, I know, but... Um, <laughs> the more recent example is Evan Turner. <laughs> uh, I mean, Evan Turner, is, he was... Uh, Struggle to shoot, bust label on Boston. Well, I mean, no, actually, he 
he was a bust label before that. He actually on Boston had his best couple of years. He was still a bust label though. I don't know. <laughs> well, just because he was a number two. Because I knew you weren't talking about Evan Turner, but I'm like, this sounds like Evan Turner. But like, that's someone that maybe Billups could just instill some confidence in. Um, from everything I've heard, Billups is a lot like his college coach, Jerry Stackhouse, who is someone I'm really high on as well. Um, but that preaches accountability and uh, through film study and mindset approach type stuff. So maybe Billups could unlock a little bit of that. And he is shown to be a respectable on ball defender and kind of gets after it on people. So um, I think that trade just, kind of solves the problem of get someone out of here who's just not really trying at all times, gets us under the tax, gets us a potential guy who could uh, have a higher ceiling than um, a lot of players on our current roster. And then also, uh, if he remembers how to shoot, could provide that spacing that you're talking about if we move CJ for someone like a... Ben Simmons or Siakam. Yeah, yeah. I just, I'm not. I Neesmith hasn't proven it in the league yet, mm-hmm. so I, that's risky too. That's risky. That's just as risky to me as like Nas hoping Nas improves from three. If you get some picks in it though, those are also ones you could flip along with that trade exception to get another guy. Yeah, I'm just... maybe maybe if you get two first, you flip those to Indiana for a uh, Tory Craig, and then you have. Kind of that, just like a it's, backup four or something. A tough guy. Yeah, but it's just like for that. The only way that Neesmith trade makes sense is if you trade for Siakam, and the only way you're gonna probably be able to realistically flip those picks slash the trade exception would be if you did the Neesmith trade before the trade deadline, like at least a few days before, you know, minimum a couple. Uh, so it's like the only way for that Neesmith trade to make sense is if you do flip it into using that trade exception. So it's like you have to, you'd have to make the Siakam trade happen, like well before the trade deadline. Well, I mean, I'm pretty sure most people want that to happen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just like that's the thing is if this is all happening like in like right at the trade deadline then i don't think you have the time to be able to do the trades necessary to make the moves make sense so that's yeah i i don't know there's just not many like good three and d threes that are on teams that aren't contending that's why I say you just take a chance on someone and it solves other problems too. Maybe a little bit of addition by subtraction and maybe a little bit of um, just help in terms of just bringing a new face to the team and just mixing it up, having Nance starting. Um, and then you also get way under the tax and not, don't have to worry about that as much. If you did trade a CJ for a Siakam who makes $3 million more, you'd still be under the under the tax. Uh, yeah. I don't. <clears throat> yeah. So I don't think it necessarily de- is determinate on that, but Miles Bridges would be fun. <laughs> I wish we could go out and get him. <laughs> there's, there's no error. Yeah. I know, I know. I just Miles Bridges is somebody I've always liked. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know, man. Chat's tossing out like Gallinari. Why? Yeah, Gallinari, an old injury-prone power forward. Um. Josh Hart is interesting, but he's undersized at the three. We'd still be playing three guards, yeah. in my mind. Yeah. Um, that's the only problem with Josh Hart. Oh, he's like only Josh shooting 32% from three this year and shot 32% last year. So it's like at that point, just start Nas then. Because Josh Hart hasn't been shooting well. Granted, he might get better looks playing next to Dame and... I almost said Dame and CJ. Dame and Norm. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I... He's averaging almost four assists a game this year. Josh Hart is. So, but he's just undersized. He's 6'5", but he has a short wingspan. 
Bob and Weave, I was obviously talking about him as a coach, not a basketball player, because, yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, Could never say anything without someone. Like... Kevin Love, no way. No, no, no. No, no, no. Um... Yeah, I don't know. Um, there's no, like, if you made a CJ plus Roko for Siakam trade, which I think it makes sense because you would need a little bit more value in that trade and you could probably get a first-round pick from a team to toss to Toronto and then CJ somewhere else for some pieces to toss to Toronto for Siakam. Like it maybe Toronto was new Smith. I mean, maybe. Maybe <laughs> in, like, Boston we probably want Roko. So, you know, I mean, there's the... I think the most obvious thing would be CJ and Rocco and yeah, CJ and Rocco to and maybe a Toronto first to Philadelphia, Simmons to Toronto and Siakam to Portland. I think that's the most obvious one. It helps Portland duck the tax. They save about what nine million dollars in that trade. So they duck the tax. They they would end up six million dollars under the tax. Um, so it'd make Jody happy. It'd be kind of the player that we need in Siakam. Um, yeah, I I don't know. Um, Man. You just need to find a three after that, which would be insanely tough. I, I swear some of these people were in our stream last night. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> I don't know. Like, uh, Vando mentions Jonathan Isaac. Were you not there last night, Vando? I thought Vando was there. Yeah, I thought so too. Um, I mean, we're not, we don't have the assets to get a Brandon Ingram if we don't have CJ. And even then, I don't think we have the assets. That's the problem. Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, it'd probably just end up in a situation where Nas starts, or you hope for a buyout. Is there any buyout small forwards that would make sense around the deadline? Um, the big names that I keep hearing are Gary Harris and Thaddeus Young, neither of which, I mean, I guess Gary Harris could kind of play a small far, but he's small, so, yeah. Nah, he's a guard. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be three guards, I yeah. mean. Um, <sighs> okay, one, Indiana is not trading Sabonis. Two, what would they want from us for him? And three, that's to have a non- defensive big <laughs> on our team I just I don't I don't think that's an ideal fit yeah I mean offensively I think it'd be kind of cool to see him with Dame but we need to fix the defense, defense though yeah. and he doesn't fix the defense Hyper Prime says he hopes for submitting our resumes. <laughs> Jason Lee, I didn't say he wasn't washed I'm just listing names of people that I hear are Bad guys. Like Bagley doesn't play defense either and is a big and is injury prone. So like Bagley I'm not interested in for Roko. We'd have to find a three, man. I, I don't I I seriously doubt Portland made that Philadelphia would just give Curry away in that trade. Yeah. He's like the perfect Mori player for that team. So. And honestly, like Maxi, CJ and Curry as a three guard lineup is nasty. <laughs> <laughs> so nasty offensively. And then they got I mean, Embiid. They got defenders to make up for that. <laughs> I swear, man, his name. Listen, at least. I don't... We've, we've been talking about trades for like 45 minutes. Yeah. Is there anyone yeah. other than Seattle? And Seattle's been in here, man. I don't I know. understand. I know. You were thing. here last night, too, man. Yeah, we've talked about numerous guys other than Siakam, but that's really the guy it comes back to for me. But we've talked about numerous guys. But most of it is like, this guy doesn't work for this reason. This guy doesn't work for this reason. Um, maybe something surprising comes out around the trade deadline. You never know. But like right now... Um, actually, Justin, Justin Holiday on his own as a as a follow-up to see Occam might be might be the guy that might that might be, that might be the guy is Justin Holiday 
I mean, he's a lot like Snell, though. <laughs> he's a much better on ball defender, though, right? Yeah, they're both kind of okay. I think he's he's a better defender than Snell. At least that's what I've heard. Like, I've heard raving things about his defense. Obviously, I don't watch the Pacers enough to know by the eye test, but from what I've heard, he's a really good on ball defender. They're not trading Franz Wagner at <laughs> Yeah. Which Franz Wagner looks like a great pick, man. Wagner looks like the next. Wagner reminds me of like a Siakam. Like in the things that he's good at. What? Why would the Hawks want CJ McCollum? Why would why would the Kings want CJ McCollum? Um, the Kings have a million guards already, and they're rebuilding. They're not going to trade a young, better player, a younger and better player for an older and worse player when they're rebuilding. It doesn't make sense. Um, all right, I got to go to work. All right. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> it's getting to this point, man. Yeah. It's just think about the other team sometimes when you request or when you offer a trade request. Yeah. Terrence, yeah. Terrence Ross is probably the worst player imaginable we could <laughs> trade for. Yeah, Terrence Ross doesn't play defense at all. That's and he's not efficient. He's just a shot chucker on a bad team. I I don't. Eugene, we'd love OG, but I don't think Toronto's going to trade him. Yeah, like, there's no way we get OG and Siakam. Because that's the thing. I'm thinking Siakam and then finding a starting three, like, assuming we trade CJ and Roko in a multi-team deal for Siakam. So I'm trying to figure out who could we do as the starting three. No! Uh, now I'm upset. Why? The Blazers could sign Maybe the new maybe the new GM has likes him. I'm upset. I'm actually I'm actually really upset. <laughs> wow, I'm actually pissed. Damani, we've mentioned that several times. We uh that's the tough part about these trades. That's why we always make Siakam trades a three team trade for the most part. Why did it Bro, like, I don't... Oh, my God. I'm, I'm upset. Uh, they Thanks, signed, Travis. They signed Wes Matthews. They signed Wes. Why'd they, have to, why'd they have to cut Georgios, man? That's my guy. I don't know. That's sad. I'm upset. Um. Anyway, you gotta go to work. Yep. <laughs> Have a good day, everyone. If you want my more in-depth thoughts, check out my video I posted earlier on my individual channel. And have a great day, everyone. Tori, I'll catch you later. Yeah, I'll see you. Eric's gone. There you go. Goodbye. I need to make a solo... A solo camera, so let me... Let me do that. Cool. There we go. Um, best some nice emojis. We need Chet Holmgren. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I can't think of a three. I mean, like, Batum would be perfect, but how are we getting them? You know? Like... I, uh, Batum isn't exactly gettable. The Clippers are... If the Clippers fell out of the playoff race, then maybe, but they're not going to. And then they're hoping Kawhi's back for the playoffs, so why would they trade Batum for Rocco? Or why would they Batu trade Batum for a pick? Eugene, I do DoorDash and Uber Eats, so I'll work dinner shift. I was going to work, wake up and work, like, the last hour and a half, the end of lunch, but obviously this happened. Any Zags players I would want? I mean, I'm biased towards Zag players, so, like, I would want them, but not necessarily because of what it would do for the Blazers. Uh... 
All right, Jackson, here's a five minute ban. <laughs> Since you asked for it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, uh, I don't know. I can't think of a three. Uh, Sadiq Bay is not going to get traded. Detroit's rebuilding. Paul George might want out. I highly, highly doubt it. The Clippers are a team that I could see wanting CJ, though. So, if you wanted to get crazy, you could send CJ to... The Clippers don't have future picks, though, because they traded them all in the Paul George and... Paul George and Kawhi thing, so that's the problem. I was going to say CJ to the Clippers, get Batum back. Clippers send picks to Toronto. We send a pick to Toronto. We get Siakam. Mm. You know, Rocco maybe to to the Clippers in that. Yeah, like Rocco and CJ to the Clippers. The Clippers would have to trade out like Bledsoe, Kennard, Batum. I don't know. You get weird with that, but be a lot of names because of salaries yes i'd rather keep norm over cj because cj probably has more trade value and we need better defense eugene that's a little a little too personal <laughs> for this stream man um Definitive. Did you use my uh, ref referral link so that we both get a bonus? Um, that would have that. I don't think. Yeah. If if any of you want to do DoorDash or Uber Eats, let me know and I'll give you a referral link. Double E. New Orleans does not do that. They're rebuilding. Ingram's young. Rocco is on an expiring contract and probably doesn't stay. CJ's older and not better. So people people got to think about the other team like Eric said, man. I don't see why New Orleans would do that. Uh, DeAndre Hunter is not going to get moved. He would be nice here, but he ain't getting moved. Um, I still don't want Ben Simmons. Eric wants Ben Simmons more than I do. I don't want to get... Like, we have effort issues. And Ben Simmons has effort issues. Like, I think... Shetty, Shetty Osman isn't a good defensive player. Honestly, anybody that isn't a good defender, I probably won't consider. And I feel like Shetty is uh, overachieving this season. He shot 30% from three last year. This year, on a much smaller sample, he's shooting 43%. So it looks nice, but I don't think he'll keep it up. Reddish isn't a good defender, so I'm not super high on him. Who do you want that brings in effort? I mean, Siakam. Like, CJ and Rocco, I think, are maybe the two biggest... Uh, issues effort wise i mean it's kind of a whole team at times but if you do cj and roko for siakam i think it probably fixes some of it uh defender one you're good man um yeah just let me know just email me or dm me or message me on discord or something larry marketed he plays the three <laughs> yeah we want a seven foot seven footer with the foot speed of a setter that small forward. The only reason that works is because they got Evan Mobley and Jared Allen to help make up for his slow foot speed. Jordan Nuara, I don't see what we'd give up that the Bucks would want over him. You thinking like Rocco? I mean. Mm. 
Nora Nora isn't a good defender though. He's shooting thirty five percent from three, thirty nine percent from the field. He's offensively he has some potential. He's not a good defensive player though. They'd be like taking a flyer on Neesmith. I'd almost rather do Neesmith than Nuora. It's tough, man. It's tough to find tradable. Let me look up let me look up uh Los Angeles Clippers future picks. Let's go to real GM. No, not roster. Future drafts detailed, real GM. There we go. That's what I use to see future picks. So the Clippers don't have their 2022 first. Their 2023 first, OKC can swap. The Clippers don't have their 2024 first. Their 2025 first, OKC can swap. And the Clippers don't have their 2026 first. So the, the next first round pick that the Clippers could trade is 2028. That's the only first they can trade. <coughs> so I thought they'd be an option for CJ, but uh, yeah, they don't got the assets for CJ actually. <sighs> Alvar Alvaro, that doesn't make sense. Why would a rebuilding team trade a 22 year old who's better than Rocco for Rocco? Like, Dort is better than Roko and much, much younger and fits their timeline. I, I don't... Like, Dort would be perfect for us in that situation. But... I mean, Dort wouldn't be perfect, but defensively he'd be ideal. Kyle, I've never really liked Kyle Anderson. And I don't think Memphis trades him. We need a Tayshaun Prince type player. Marvin Bagley dropped again. No, 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 no. No to Marvin Bagley, man. Um, it's just tough. Like, people talk about Reddish, but he's... Why would Atlanta give him up for Rocco? Atlanta already has Collins and Gallinari at the four. Rocco probably wouldn't even play for them. Torreon Prince is just very bleh. Like, I'd... Uh, Torreon Prince reminds me of Tony Snow. Torreon Prince is shooting 26% from three, though. No, thank you. Alright, it's, it's about to time... It's about time to end the stream. We got a Brittany Griner reference. Um, Otto Porter Jr. is not going to get traded. He's a minimum contract player. I'd like Otto Porter Jr., but he's only making $2 million, so doesn't match Rocco's $12 million. All right, guys. The trades are going off the rails here. So, probably going to end the stream. Like, TJ Warren's defense is not good. Harrison Barnes's defense is not good. Harrison Barnes's defense is average. TJ Warren's is below average. See, being, yeah. YYC says 99% of these trades don't work. Being a GM is hard. And that's the thing is people don't realize how hard it is to make a trade that makes sense. That's what people don't, don't realize. Um, I... Who's the team that offered the high draft picks for CJ? I don't think there was a team that offered a high draft pick for CJ. I think that was false. I think Quick misspoke and then people ran with it. <laughs> Dice them with our strip clubs and Tillamook cheese. Making me hungry. Um... <clears throat> Ernesto says we lose him tomorrow and any good feeling of dumping Olshay goes away. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Um... 
the definitive, I don't see why Atlanta does that. They have a lot of depth already in general. They're not going to trade a young Cameron Reddish for a third string power forward. It just doesn't make sense. Like, <clears throat> yeah, Thomas Ransky says pretty sure it was a top four protected pick. Yeah, and he, uh, I think he misheard. Also, I don't think Reddish is a good defensive player either. Nah, definitive. I was, I was joking too, man. I was thinking about getting off, getting off the stream soon, and then I saw a whole pretty Grider reference. You're funny. But nah, I'm just, I'm, I'm legitimately trying to think of options, man. And it's tough. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see if a new GM can do better than I'm doing right now in terms of thinking of options. Um, because, yeah, Jeff Teague and Rondé Hollis Jefferson ain't getting it done. Um, I just, I, if people want Ben Simmons, I don't think he, I don't want to, I want a guy that plays hard. Ben Simmons, I feel like you bring him in here and he's not going to play hard because other guys around him aren't going to play hard. Like, I'd rather have a Siakam who can, who actually is willing to shoot threes could still defend and plays hard I, I don't know yeah it's going to be interesting as we head up to the trade deadline it's going to be interesting to see who our, who our GM becomes we will I don't know if we'll do a stream when we hire a GM we probably we'll talk about it on like Blazers of Press Live or a post game show I don't know we'll see what we do if we hire a GM um but, yeah, trade-wise, I mean, it's 20 games in, so here's the trade talk you guys wanted. But it's just me telling you guys that certain things don't work or don't make sense. Um, we can't... Nicholson is not on the roster. We can't trade him. We're not even paying him anymore. Like, he's just dead money on the cap. He's just a cap hit. You can't trade that. I need to put it together a CBA, like, guide. And then drop it for you guys. Like, release it for you guys. Because it's fun thing in the trades, but it's even more fun slash frustrating too if you kind of know how how the things work. People say, like, DJ Vegas says, Isaac's my dream scenario. That's possibly realistic, but he can't even get on the court. All right, Blazers report. Uh, five minute ban. Don't insult Thomas Saransky. Next time would be a perma ban. <laughs> Thomas Saransky. Yeah, I don't know where that came from, man. Um. Yeah, a CBA a CBA guide would be cool to do. That's more like an off season thing to do though. Like before the off season starts. <laughs> Zach Landia says, insult me if you must, but not Tomo. Jonathan Isaac is the yeah, anti vax guy. He's questionable. 
Bobby Marks said the next thing we should do is start exploring Dame trades. Well, Bobby Marks is an idiot, so... Yeah, no. What? That's... That's stupid. <laughs> Just another media shill that wants Dame out of Portland. Annoying. Trevin, you're really making me upset the stream with the things you're plugging from Bobby Marks and Shams, man. The thing is, is Isaac's not gettable. What do we have that Orlando would want? Orlando's rebuilding. That's the problem. Keelan Martin. <laughs> Anyway, that's going to wrap up the stream. We'll be live tomorrow with uh, the post-game show. We'll discuss Celtics Blazers. Hopefully that's a better game than we had last night. Uh, until then, I mean, I don't know. Enjoy your Friday. Enjoy, uh, enjoy Neil Olshay has been fired day. December 3rd is going to be a Blazers holiday for the rest of... I think... Didn't, didn't Stotts get fired on June 3rd, if I recall? I don't know. It might have been a little bit later. Um, Dylan Brooks would be nice, but he I don't see Memphis trading him. I don't see why they'd trade him for Rocco. Or, and I don't see why they'd trade him for picks either, so... Get Kyrie. Yeah, because Kai... Yeah. Yeah, Kyrie fixes. Fixes things. All right. Um, yeah, I've been talking about ending it for like 10 minutes, Big Country, but I'm now finally going to end it because we could go all day talking about trades that, um, I don't know, we could go all day talking about trades, but I don't want to do that. <laughs> so, Neil Olshay is fired. We'll see who the Blazers replace him with. Uh, I, I don't know if we'll go live when we get a new gm um i don't know we'll let you guys know on our twitter page at blazers up as yt when like when a new gm gets hired we'll let you know if we're going live or not so make sure you follow that twitter page and you can turn on tweet notifications so that if youtube screws up which it's done numerous times in the past and youtube doesn't send out a notification when we go live then you can know if you have our blazers up as yt twitter notifications on so definitely go follow that account and there's a link in is there a link in the description or is it just the handle yeah there's a link in the description that takes you right to the blazers are Press twitter page so go follow that follow our twitter pages uh mine and eric's uh are also linked down there and with that that's a wrap for the stream we'll catch you tomorrow night with the post game show until then enjoy the rest of your friday as always peace out go blazers